at it's, this point. So it has I, I, been a winding road. You're right. It has been a winding road for Comey, no doubt about it. But when you hear the report that the president said that I faced great pressure because of Russia, that's taken off. I'm not under investigation. Um, we, we have attorneys who say that sounds like obstruction of justice. I think we have partisan attorneys who are ready to say whatever Trump says is a uh, reason for impeachment. But, um, you know, it's funny, Alan Gertzowicz, who uh, goes about it as a standpoint of a civil libertarian, has said on this station many times there has not been obstruction, there has not been a crime committed. Obstruction would be tampering with a jury or intimidating a witness. That has not taken place. And if James Comey, as the director of the FBI and this guy who's a seasoned mm -hmm. pro in Washington, thought that he was being intimidated, why did he not go to somebody promptly after that meeting on uh, Feb February 14th? Why that didn't is, he run out of there and said the president tried to in intimidate That is a question. Me? You're right. That's a question that has been asked a lot. Jack, I, I don't mean to uh, cut you off here, gentlemen. I just want to take a, a moment here as we look at these pictures. Um, we're seeing the president move to this document signing. Uh, we understand the White House says uh, it's a significant expansion of the over seven decade long security relationship between the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The president and Secretary Tillerson will attend a signing ceremony for almost $110 billion worth of foreign military sales. Uh, that is what we're going to be watching right here. This document signing uh, creating uh, an allegiance, so to speak, on paper uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States. They're going to be selling uh, everything. Uh, $109 billion worth of this arms deal includes a, a weapons package, tanks, fighter jets, warships. We have to remember uh, Saudi Arabia is the third largest defense spender uh, in the world, and they want to create their own defense industry, their own auto industry. Uh, they want to be strong on tourism. And a part of this package is going to help with that. It Marty. will indeed. I, I, we want to bring in Mark Fisher here to sort of talk about what we're seeing here. The significance of an arms deal goes beyond just the dollars, right, Mark? Well, certainly. I mean, given the tensions in the region, uh, this is a statement by uh, the American administration, one very much welcomed by the Saudis, uh, that this is an administration that's going to uh, deal with the Saudis the way they like to be dealt with, not with reminders of any problems with human rights, uh, not with any uh, stern admonitions about the role of women in society, but rather uh, in what D Donald Trump has always promised he would be as kind of a, a negotiating businessman, a country to country, almost company to company, in a sense. And the part of the problem of this, or criticism of this kind of arms deal, is that, of course, the concern is the, these arms, American arms, are going to be used in the conflict that's taking place right next door in Yemen. And there has been some severe criticism of civilian casualties that the Saudis have not necessarily been as mindful of as people would like, right? Well, certainly, and uh, the president is scheduled to be in the same room with leaders of uh, Yemen and other countries in the region uh, that uh, might have been difficult for previous presidents to meet with or at least to be in the same room with. Uh, this is a president who made it clear before the trip that he will not be bringing along that uh, sort of uh, moral human rights baggage <laughs> or uh, a position that American presidents have carried uh, to that region in the past. And this is something that's being welcomed uh, by certain countries, including Saudi Arabia. Mark, a lot of Americans may be sitting in their living rooms night wa right now watching this and remembering that uh, a majority of the 9-11 attackers came from Saudi Arabia. So they watched this possibly with some questions that they have. Do you have a, a sense of whether Saudi Arabia is committed to fighting terrorism on the scale the U.S. wants it to? Well, certainly the Saudis say they are, and uh, they are uh, making a commitment that they they think they can work with this administration uh, better than they were able to with the Obama administration, uh, and they believe that uh, that they are simpatico with uh, Trump and the people he's put in place and uh, fighting terrorism around the world. Now, uh, Donald Trump's use of the phrase radical Islamic terrorism uh, certainly very controversial in that part of the world. Um, you know, there's a, a real disconnect between the kind of rhetoric 
rhetoric that this president used to get elected about Muslims, about the Muslim world, uh, versus the kind of attitude that he's bringing now on this trip. So we'll see in this speech uh, coming up uh, by the president in Saudi Arabia, written by Stephen Miller, uh, his aide who was behind a lot of his very tough rhetoric on Muslims. Uh, that speech coming up, uh, we're hearing maybe a little more conciliatory and open to the Muslim world uh, than what we've heard from his pen in the past. All right, and we're looking here as you see the King of Saudi Arabia and you see President Trump sitting down there. They're being handed uh, the documents. Now, of course, we can't see them uh, specifically ourselves, but we believe that this is the $110 billion arms deal that uh, the Trump administration has been talking about even before President Trump landed in Saudi Arabia. It certainly adds up in a lot of dollars. There is some question as to what the offsets are, and when it comes to the manufacture of some of this hardware, Will it be Americans that benefit from it, or will it be Saudis? Because part of the deal, apparently, at least when it comes to helicopters, they will be manufacturing them in Saudi Arabia, which would mean those jobs are not going to be in the U.S. Saudi Arabia very much wants to begin uh, beefing up its own uh, military industry as far as being able to make the weapons themselves and not just buy them from the United States. The United States likes to see Saudi Arabia with a strong military because it is seen as a counter to the forces of Iran, and you can bet that Iran is watching the president's mm -hmm. visit very carefully right now. And remember, Iran just went through an election and uh, has renewed uh, their president for the second time. Let's just listen. seem to be the end of uh, uh, at least the signing portion. All of this, of course, is carefully, at least visually, controlled by the Saudis. They have been showing this. They know it's being played in the United States and throughout the Middle East as well. Uh, and the Saudis, of course, can uh, carefully control the message, which is in part what is happening here. President Trump, for the most part, has been relatively quiet. Yeah, Nick Robertson is joining us now from Riyadh. Nick, uh, we just witnessed here uh, the signing of this, uh, this arms deal. That's one of the things we were watching. Uh, but help walk us through what we've seen here in the last two, three hours, uh, four hours, I guess now, since the president has arrived in Saudi Arabia, because it has been a welcome like one we have not seen in the past. Oh, absolutely. It's been a very warm welcome. And, and part of it has been to do with the deals that we've just seen signed there, a $110 billion uh, arms deal uh, that's being signed there. We talked earlier about a $6 billion arms deal that's being signed. Uh, the Black Hawk helicopters you mentioned there, 150 of them, Lockheed Martin Black Hawk helicopters to be assembled in Saudi Arabia. Um, Raytheon also to do some production as part of that $6 billion deal here in Saudi Arabia. And GE, GE having armored vehicles assembled here in Saudi Arabia, again, as part of that $6 billion deal. And that's part of the Saudis' aim here, is to, is to build uh, their own uh, weapons industry. They need to do that because they're trying to modernize the country. The deputy crown prince, who is the defense minister and the king's son, has this vision they call here the 2030 vision to shift the country from 40% private sector employment to 65% private sector employment by 2030. So what, what the Saudis are getting out of this is delivery on some of that to help uh, to help get their arms industry up and running. They want to build car manufacturing plants as well. Uh, there, there are a number of other things that, that, that they want to do, improve their standing in the global airline sector. But there are deals here that we're told that are going to benefit the United States. The $22 billion worth of uh, oil and gas deals are being signed. $12 billion of it could, be as, could go up to as much as $18 billion with Saudi Aramco, who are going to be um, allowing, uh, the, the are going to be uh, giving 
giving some of their refining capacity, if you will, moving that to Port Arthur in Texas. We're told that that could bring two and a half thousand jobs to Port Arthur, Texas, right as a get-go of this deal. If the deal goes well and all goes through as expected or hoped, by 2023, you could have as many as 12,000 12, additional jobs in Port Arthur, Texas. So all of these things are on the horizon. Dow signing a deal for $100 million uh, here to build a manufacturing plant. Uh, GE signing a 15, uh, $22 billion deal, uh, a $15 billion deal rather for a power generation plant and other facilities. So uh, the deals are going both ways. They're intended to benefit both countries. But when you're talking about figures as big as, 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 big as the ones we're talking about, $110 billion in the arms industry, for example, a lot of, a lot of the capacity in that will fall to the United States. But absolutely, the Saudis are going to not let this opportunity get away, as we've seen today, trying to build closer ties to the United States, but trying to get long-term benefit from it to move away, move their, 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 their uh, capacity in the country, move it away from the oil sector into other areas. Uh, and certainly you'll get some regional experts would say that that would be a good thing for the long-term stability of the region. Obviously, uh, weapons procurement on the scale that Saudi Arabia is doing, given the anim high animosity with Iran, also uh, will be a troubling detail. However, uh, these are the deals that are being signed here today. And just to remind our viewers, you're looking at live pictures now coming from Saudi Arabia, President Trump's first overseas visit, the first country he went to was Saudi Arabia. And uh, we just had the signing of what we believe was a major arms deal. And we continue to follow and look as uh, government leaders and meet with representatives of the administration. And uh, there are also members of the royal family and the Saudi leadership as well. There's a large contingent from the United States. Uh, Nick, I wanted to ask you this. You know, we talk about $110 billion. We talk about other projects. The Saudis don't have uh, as well, I should say this. The cost of oil has gone down significantly and with it to somewhat the economics of the Saudi nation. So they are not, they're still a very rich and very powerful nation, but they didn't, they don't have as much as they used to, right? They don't, and they're borrowing in a way that they weren't, and they're selling off some of their major oil company, Aramco, so that they can raise money through an IPO, raise money to invest in projects like car manufacturing, invest in tourism, invest in, in an airline hub. They've got an eye to the future, but they don't have the money, and part of the reason for that is the price of oil has dropped, and that leaves the royal family, you know, the government in this country who has a, a, a massive amount of wealth, and many people in the country who don't enjoy that same sort right. of wealth have seen... Uh, uh, their prices of fuel, gas and oil go up, uh, subsidies come down. And while the price of oil dropped, those subsidies were cut. That, that, there was a backlash against that. So only recently the government has reinstated those subsidies. So yes, it's, it's a precarious situation for the government here. Uh, the price of oil is key to their future. Uh, it's coming back up a little bit. But absolutely, when oil drops to $25 a barrel, um, that hurts the Saudis hugely. Not just, not just in their pockets, but the potential stability uh, for this uh, oil-rich kingdom. It's no good being rich in oil, if you will. The price of oil is so low, and they know that. Mm -hmm. They do indeed, yeah. And that's part of, the, as you point out, um, not everybody in Saudi Arabia loves the uh, Saud family. Yeah, they, they believe that um, there are some real problems and it goes right to the top. So yes, when, when the social, social infrastructure, as it were, the social net, uh, declines because of the price of oil, then you're going to get unrest, and that's the last thing the Saudis want. We do want to let you know that um, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and his Saudi counterpart will be speaking uh, in just about 40 minutes as well. We will take that for you live uh, when that happens. But Nick, uh, before we watched this signing, we were having this conversation about the breaking news here in the U.S. from the New York Times uh, and uh, some comments that the president uh, allegedly made uh, uh, to his Russia, Russian leaders uh, when they were at the Oval Office. How much of a White House under investigation is of concern to the Saudis, to Israel, to the Vatican on, on this trip? How much of that will overshadow, if at all, what's happening in these countries with, with the president's visit? 
Well, certainly for the Israelis, who it does seem to be that it was their intelligence that President Trump in the Oval Office uh, apparently, allegedly, shared with uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Foreign Minister, Sergei Kasiliak, the, uh, the Russian ambassador to the United States, um, that Israel would have a deep uh, and abiding concern that their sources may be compromised, that the information may be given to the Iranians. Um, so the, all of this would be a, a deep worry for them, and perhaps there will be some side discussions about that, although General McMaster has been very clear. And it was wholly the conversations he said were wholly appropriate in the Oval Office that day by the president. Um, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has taken a very firm stance behind the United States, behind President Trump, pretty much from the get-go. And in, in a way, you can call it a gamble. It, it can backfire. It can backfire more in a democracy. If you take, for example, Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, went to meet President Trump very quickly. There was a backlash when the uh, travel ban was instituted. It reflected badly on her at home. Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, reflected badly on her. Both of these leaders are going to the polls in their own countries for re-election uh, in, in the coming months, so it can hurt them. But here, when the king puts his weight behind President Trump, he's not going, going to be going through an election. If there is some bad press, um, he perhaps believes that he can weather it, whereas where other leaders in more democratic countries around the world may be more careful about associating themselves so strongly with the United States. Saudi Arabia, the king clearly believes that so much is at stake that the United States, that President Trump in person, can potentially be a worthwhile ally, worthwhile that risk. Uh, we talk about that risk in political terms, but in religious terms, of course, this is the cradle of Islam uh, and President Trump to give that, that key speech about Islam uh, tomorrow. And there'll be many, many Muslim leaders and Arab and regional leaders here to hear that. So in some ways, the king also gambling that President Trump gets the nuance of that message to call for a more peaceful version of Islam, a more, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a one that doesn't push people towards terrorism, if you will. Um, he's likely to get a good reception on that. But if he gets the nuance wrong, the king has taken a very big gamble backing him there. But again, in a country like this, an autocracy, um, that perhaps the king has more leeway to make associations like this than others might in other countries. And Nick, you know, we talk about the security issue since we're talking about the signing of a military deal. Uh, the United States, of course, is very focused on the battle against ISIS. And yet the, the Saudis are focused more on Iran. And I'm wondering if it's possible that the two may think they're talking the same thing, but they're actually talking past one another. You know, I, I've, I've wondered the same thing myself. And as so often happens when you have big meetings like this between leaders and where they only have a brief time with each other, you do wonder if they talk past each other. But here, the, the, the key of today, I think, has been that the king has spent so much time with President Trump. And of course, the opportunity is there for them to talk past each other and miss that point. It was interesting when the foreign minister spoke here two days ago. He spoke about how Iran must be made to behave, made to behave like a normal country, respect international law. Um, in a 45 minute press briefing, he didn't talk about the fight against ISIS. Interestingly, when uh, uh, Defense, Secretary of Defense Mattis was here a month ago, he also said that we must help uh, Saudi Arabia with its resistance against, um, uh, against Iran's um, uh, intent in this region, against their mischief in the region is how he characterized it. So on Iran, both sides seem to line up. And I think when we look at what the king here has done, it was only a year or so ago he built a very big Sunni alliance of 35 nations, essentially to have a Sunni force ready to go and fight, potentially, uh, for Sunni interests in Syria. Um, that, of course, was all kind of stood down because it was, it, was an, it was the wrong message at a time peace talks were getting underway. So when it comes to tackling ISIS, um, countries like Saudi Arabia are under threat from ISIS uh, and, and al-Qaeda. They, they threaten uh, the, the monarchy directly because this is the holiest place, uh, holiest country for Islam. So uh, they, this is something that they will, the United States, President Trump, will find support here on. However, as you rightly point out, it doesn't appear to be on the top of the agenda. So I would guess that's something that President Trump, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis, Secretary Tillerson, are also are going to have to push to keep that narrative going and to define the precise support that they want. Uh, certainly, uh, Saudi Arabia um, has provided useful intelligence to combat al-Qaeda and ISIS in the region over the past several years that has directly helped the United States.
Uh, Mark Fisher, senior editor for the Washington Post. I want to bring you back into the conversation here. We heard Nick um, talk about almost the trust that the Saudi king is putting in President Trump, particularly for the speech tomorrow mm -hmm. and what he's going to say to these 50 Mus these leaders of 50 Muslim countries uh, tomorrow. We know the White House is saying it's going to be, uh, they hope, a, a speech of unity. Uh, but, uh, Mark, do, do you think that the president can speak with authority in bringing religious faiths together, particularly Muslims, uh, on the same page uh, when he has said so many other things as candidate Trump that would be offensive to them. Well, that's a tough uh, line that he's going to have to walk. And obviously, he's dealing with two very different audiences. There's the audience uh, of the Middle East, of Arab countries, uh, Muslim countries around the world that are waiting to hear uh, very skeptically from a president who they believe uh, large majorities in polling uh, in the Middle East showing that uh, people in Muslim countries believe this president is anti-Muslim. Uh, meanwhile, he has the other audience back home that he needs to appeal to, uh, many of the people who elect him did so in part because he did talk so tough about Muslims, about radical Islamic terrorism. Uh, so there is a real disconnect there between his need to uh, talk to his base back home and show that he's still the tough talking, straight talking president that they elected uh, versus the Muslim world, which is waiting to hear from a president uh, who says that he wants to work with these countries uh, in a common effort against ISIS and against terrorism. All righty. Do stay with us. We're going to have more as we take a quick break. But you are watching live pictures from Saudi Arabia as President Trump can check the box of one of the uh, accomplishments he wanted to achieve when he was in Saudi Arabia. They have just signed this deal, we believe, for the $110 billion uh, arms deal uh, weapons package that will go to Saudi Arabia uh, in conjunction with the United States. Do stay close. We're back in just a moment. Welcome back. So grateful to have you with us. I'm Christy Paul. And I'm Martin Savage in for Victor Blackwell. A high stakes trip with the president under pressure. President Trump is in Saudi Arabia for his first trip abroad. The president is taking part in a bilateral meeting with Saudi royalty, just wrapping up a signing ceremony for a $110 billion arms deal. These are live pictures coming to you from Saudi Arabia this hour. Now, the magnitude of the event is being overshadowed, however, by the probe into his campaign's possible ties to Russia. There's a New York Times report this morning claiming the president told two Russian officials inside the Oval Office, including a top Russian spy, that uh, FBI Director James Comey was a, quote, nut job, and the, quote, great pressure he felt from the Russia probe had been taken off. I want to talk about this with Bob Baer, CNN intelligence and security analyst and former CIA operative, Clarissa Ward, CNN senior international correspondent, and Kimberly Dozier, CNN global affairs analyst and senior national security correspondent with The Daily Beast. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for sticking around. We're going to keep the live pictures up there, as you see on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, as the signing ceremony continues uh, and makes its way through its uh, normal procedure. But uh, Bob, I, I want to get from you your reaction to this New York Times report and the allegations in it. Well, you'd never air your, you know, your, your, your you know, internal secrets, your dirty laundry with a foreign government, especially an adversary like Russia. It's just not done, mm -hmm. especially when those same Russians are under investigation. It looks bad here. It looks bad abroad. I think that the president was just trying to, you know, loosen up the conversation, be frank. But really, this, this, was, a, this was a diplomatic uh, meeting, and you, you do not do that. And I think that's come across, and it's going to hurt him in the long run, and especially when you look at the Washington Post, when, you, when there's a subject of interest in the White House. This is going to be coming out this week, I would imagine. So the pressure, in fact, was not relieved. It's gotten worse. Clarissa, let me ask you this. We've been watching, and of course, all morning, President Trump's visit to Saudi Arabia. It's the start, actually, just the beginning of an eight-day trip through the Middle East and Europe. And the goal, I think many believe, is to reset relations with the Muslim world. What are you hearing about it? Well, 
Martin, I think that this actually might be one of the few parts of the world, uh, I'm talking specifically about Saudi Arabia, where President Trump is really being embraced. In fact, uh, many of the Gulf countries did not enjoy a great relationship with the Obama administration. They felt that his policy on Syria uh, was not productive. They also were uh, dismayed by the Iran nuclear deal. And there's a sense now that under President Trump, uh, there can be, as you said, a kind of reset of relations to try to uh, get the U.S. back on track in terms of bolstering its relationship with Sunni Muslim powers in the Arab world. So I think that President Trump has probably found so far this has been a very friendly visit. As we saw, the king himself came and greeted the president as he came off the plane. The same did not happen uh, with President Obama. Now they've been signing this $110 billion weapons deal. And obviously, uh, the sort of moment that everyone's waiting for now is to see what kind of a tone President Trump will will adopt in this speech that he is supposed to be giving about Islam. And it is a very crucial tone that he needs to strike in order to appease both uh, Muslims in the Arab world, who perhaps feel that his policies have shown uh, signs of Islamophobia, but also to appease his voters here back home, who elected him precisely because they do feel he has taken uh, a more sort of clear speak, openly uh, sort of skeptical of Islam's relationship to the threat of terror, Martin. Kim, as we watch uh, really the pageantry of this morning, I mean, it's been three or four hours of a lot of uh, ceremonial, traditional, mm -hmm. uh, very grandeur um, or grandiose I don't know, pageantry, I guess, is really the best word for it when you think about it. Uh, but I'm wondering, what do you think, it, it, when you look at everything that's involved here, has to happen for the president to be able to call this trip overall a success? Well, they've already lined up a number of what they call deliverables. White House officials briefed us before they departed on this trip and said you'll see it each step of the way, something like the large arms deal that was just signed. So at the end of this, um, they can say that this trip, which was really showcasing what Jared Kushner can do, because he organized the bulk of this, um, that this president is serious about foreign policy. Now, on the Saudi side of things, what they explained to a small group of us before this trip kicked off is that they think that this president can, through his unconventional ways, break some of the log jams in the Middle East, possibly even bring about peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What I'm hearing behind closed doors, though, is that they see a president under siege and they see an opportunity to show him the pomp and circumstance and respect that he feels he's not getting at home and quietly deliver a message to him. Say things like, that phrase you use, radical Islamic terrorism, it really makes it hard for us with our people and we're at the front lines of the fight. Please stop using it. One sign that that message might already be getting through, and by the way, it's a message that the president is also hearing from his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, but an AP obtained copy of the speech doesn't contain that phrase. We'll see what uh, he actually delivers tomorrow. Bob, uh, let me ask you this. You know, there's a dualism, I guess, going on here in the sense that the Saudis look at themselves, uh, of course, as keepers of the Islamic faith. And candidate Trump was highly critical of the Muslim faith. Now, President Trump visiting this country. And I'm wondering, do the Saudis, they're pragmatic people, do they just forget everything that Trump said when he was on the campaign trail and put it up to a man running for office? Oh, absolutely. They're not going to bring this up. They, they are too polite, the Saudis, to bring it up with the President of the United States. Uh, but more than that, what we really have to look at is the Saudis need the United States. This is why they signed this arms deal and other deals, because they are worried, terrified, if you like, of Iran. Iranian influence is, is supreme in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. The Saudis are aggrieved by the Obama administration. When Obama went to Riyadh last year, he was met by the governor, which was a snub, an insult to Obama. And now they're hoping for a reset. They would really like the United States to do something to contain Iran wherever 
But what they don't want is a Shia Levant, which on the top and in Yemen to their south, an Iranian-influenced Houthi government. Uh, this is an existential threat to the Saudis, and they're willing to bend over backwards and forget the past if the Americans are willing to help them in their security. Now, the question is, can it, Americans everyday Americans sitting in their living rooms forget the past because I, I think it's it's fair to say a lot of people are watching this and they are remembering that the majority of 9-11 attackers were from Saudi Arabia um, so Clarissa when we when we know that they may be sitting there wondering here we are signing this billion dollar plus arm this hundred billion dollar arms deal is Saudi Arabia committed to fighting terrorism on the scale, on the scope, within the boundaries with which the U.S. is wanting to fight? Well, Chrissy, I think that's a really good question and certainly one that's on the minds of a lot of Americans. The best description I have heard for the sort of Saudi relationship with the whole issue of terrorism uh, was one I read by a historian who said that on the issue of terror, the Saudis are both the arsonists <laughs> and they are the firefighters. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, Saudi Arabia is largely responsible for exporting this kind of austere fundamentalist version of Islam known as uh, Wahhabism that has really spread like wildfire across the entire world and which is seen by many as contributing to uh, sort of extremism that we have seen proliferating across the entire world. At the same time, nobody stands to lose more uh, than the Saudi monarchy to terrorists because most terrorist groups view the Saudi monarchy as being uh, heretics, in fact, because they view them as traitors to Islam. So they are, on the one hand, uh, partially responsible for the proliferation of this ideology, but on the other hand, they are fighting very hard to try to stomp out these various extremist groups because they pose a threat to their very existence. I think what Americans need to understand is you have to be somewhat practical about this matter. The reality is Saudi Arabia is the most important Sunni Muslim country in the Arab world and any effort to try to stomp out terrorist groups, to cut off their funding, uh, cannot be successful if you do not have partnerships like those with the Saudis. So. You may, some people argue that it's making a deal with the devil and you have to hold your nose and just do it. But certainly when you look at, if the end goal is to try to eliminate extremism or at least minimize the threat of some of these dangerous terrorist groups like ISIS, it's very difficult to envision being able to do that without the help of Saudi forces, Saudi counterterrorism, Saudi intelligence, and so on, Christy. And you're looking at live pictures that are coming from Saudi Arabia as President Trump makes his first international visit. Um, the interesting choice of Saudi Arabia as the very first country he goes to, particularly given the rhetoric in the campaign against Muslims in general. Um, we should point out that these images are coming uh, from Saudi Arabian television. So they are coming to us, uh, I guess you could say they're managed by the Saudi government. This is all being carefully orchestrated, both visually and in words and deeds. Uh, to put the very best spin on it. And you see the opulence and you see the magnificence there of, of the royal surroundings in which all of this is taking place. Kimberly, let me ask you this. If you're Iran and you're watching this, what are you thinking? You're thinking that you're seeing a new alliance arrayed against you, that the channel has changed from the Obama administration for at least the next four years. And it's, it's a good thing that this visual happened after the Iranian elections because, of course, the moderate compared to the um, uh, person he was running against uh, looks like he's won again according to the election returns. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Hassan Rouhani in charge, that means that perhaps they will stick with the Iranian deal with the terms and try to get some economic benefits from other nations. The U.S. has already signaled this week the Trump administration passed new sanctions against uh, Iranian defense officials over Iran's continued ballistic missile program, which it's allowed to do despite the Iranian, mis uh, the Iranian nuclear deal. That wasn't part of the deal, and that's part of what the Trump administration has criticized uh, the outgoing Obama administration for, the past Obama administration, because it didn't make 
Iran's behavior throughout the region or its um, ballistic missile program part of getting money and economic return for the deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're Iran watching this, you're waiting to see, okay, how does this play out on the ground? Does this mean we're going to see increased patrols against us or simply increased economic action? And um, does this mean we're going to see something like uh, in places like Syria, some sort of uh, military offset or pushback to Iranian support to Syrian forces or to Hezbollah inside Lebanon? All right. So, Bob, Kim just uh, mentioned the Iranian nuclear agreement that is in place. Do you think that at this point President Trump will leave it as is? Does he have an alternative? He doesn't have an alternative. I mean, it's, a, it's not a bad agreement. It holds off any development of nuclear weapons by the Iranians, good inspection regime. Uh, but it's not really nuclear weapons that disturbs the Trump administration right now. It's their aggressive policies in Iraq and Syria uh, and that also scares the Israelis and it's no coincidence that Trump is going from Riyadh to Tel Aviv to reassure them about Iran. Don't forget that Hezbollah sits on uh, Israel's border, has a lot of rockets trained on Tel Aviv and can do major damage. Question is how do you contain Iran? They are clearly the victor uh, you know in the first decade of the, of the you know 21st century and you know they are getting stronger and they are a stable country and the Middle East Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states are are truly terrified of Iran and what can the United States do at this point General Mattis the Secretary of Defense recognizes Iran as a threat as well so what we're going to have to see is what is this Riyadh meeting translate to you know in terms of containing Iran it's, it's unclear right now Bob real quick can I ask you we just talked about this you know 110 billion dollar deal. Um, sometimes uh, Trump can portray deals bigger than they may truly be. He's, he's mentioned a lot about the potential for jobs here. How many jobs, you don't have to give me numbers, but how realistic is that it will be a real job creator? Did you hear me, Bob? Oh, yeah, I, yes. I, it's it's going to help. No, this is, this is going to be a victory for, for Trump. Um, it, because it will bring jobs, it will bring refining capacity. Uh, Saudi Arabia is selling part of Aramco. Uh, we're going to be part of that deal. Um, I think that after all the turmoil in Washington, uh, this is going to be a, a victory for him so far. And I think the meeting in Tel Aviv, it's going to be great relief from the pressure of Washington. And I think that President Trump is going to find, uh, you know, that these visits abroad are better than facing the music back in Washington. All right, Bob Baer, uh, Kim Doja, Clarissa Ward, so grateful to uh, have your perspective mm -hmm. as we watch this unfolding yeah. here uh, hour by hour. Thank you so much. And uh, just a reminder that in about 15 minutes, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and his counterpart there in Saudi Arabia are to speak live. We will take that when it happens. We're going to take a short break here. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Do stay close.